Hello and welcome back to my Stuart's vlog. Uh, this is episode 14 and in this time we're going to be thinking about uh, dissent or nonconformity um, and how uh, that rises through the Stuart's era. Um, so again, like uh, the other couple of religion episodes we've done, we're going to look at the whole story uh, of dissent through um, the three sort of phases under Charles the first and then uh, into the Republic and then uh, in the Restoration era. So um, first of all, uh, a dissenter or a nonconformist are someone who does not agree uh, that the Church of England is uh, the church for them. Uh, they are dissenting against that church line or they are not conforming with it. Broadly speaking, these take two um, uh, paths, I guess. Uh, the first one is that um, you have dissenters or nonconformists who would like to be part of the church, but feel like the Church of England, as it currently stands, is not the true church or not church as it ought to be. Uh, and then uh, you get a, a group of dissenters or nonconformists who uh, just want to be part of a different church, that they reject the Church of England, don't think it can be reformed, that they want out. At the start of our course, uh, just in that first sort of bit where Charles I is king, most of this dissent uh, is quite small um, and it focuses around Puritans. Um, they tend to be the phrase that we use to lump them all in together. Now, Puritans want specific things. They want particularly to end Catholic influence, all Catholic influence in the Church of England. They see some uh, Catholic influence still hanging around. They want to get rid of that. Um, a particularly good example of that is the celebration of festivals and Saints Days, which is one of the reasons that um, later on uh, Christmas gets banned by the Puritans. They want to get rid of bishops uh, because they see that as a, a hangover of the old Catholic structure uh, of the church. They want a simplified form of worship. They don't like ritual. They don't like robes on their priests. They don't like music. Um, of course, things like incense and stained glass as well. Um, which is why a lot of them are anti-Arminian. So you often see Puritans set up against the Arminians because they're very much different ends of the Church of England. And Puritans also put a heavy emphasis on the Bible and God speaking to uh, people through the Bible and therefore um, sermons, the explanation and interpretation of the Bible takes the key uh, role or key uh, position in their meetings that they have. Now, as I say, um, Puritans... And nonconformity generally are, are pretty low level in general uh, in, under, in the reign of Charles I, but pretty influential as well. And so uh, people like John Pym and John Hampton are both good examples of Puritans. Um, and uh, then you get sort of famous instances of uh, John Bastwick and Henry Burton and William Prynne, who are all persecuted or prosecuted and persecuted um, by uh, in the Star Chamber hmm, court, prerogative courts for sure, maybe High Commission, not Star Chamber. Um, they are uh, each of them is fined five thousand pounds. They're imprisoned for life and they get their ears removed as well. Now these are for writing anti-Arminian texts. John Bastwick wrote anti-Arminian stuff. Uh, William Prynne wrote stuff that was against the uh, um, uh, religious. Um, uh, policies of the day. Uh, he wrote a, a, a document called Histriomatics. Histriomatics. Histriomatics, I guess. Um, and that was uh, the reason that he was prosecuted and persecuted. Uh, and Henry Burton uh, was a vicar who uh, preached stuff that went way off what he was meant to be saying and again you know, disagreed with the Arminian line of William Lord. So um, around this time there was a uh, very much Puritan kind of um, feeling and and growth there, but it was small but pretty influential. Uh, by 1640 there were eight congregationalist um, churches in London. Um, you can see that as being eight or eight, only eight. Uh, the first one was founded by Henry Jacob in 1616. Congregationalists of course believe that uh, each congregation, each gathering of a church should be kind of in, independent um, and appoint their own leader and uh, that there is no sort of hierarchy or structure um, and certainly that they shouldn't be controlled. So um, this was eight and it had grown you know, from one in 1616. But London is kind of seen as being the centre of uh, dissent and nonconformity and there's only eight. So um, during the Civil War, uh, ideas spread. And after the Civil War, you kind of get a growth, a massive growth, really, uh, in dissent and nonconformity. The reasons things spread in the war uh, is that the New Model Army is quite a seedbed for um, 
non-conformist ideas, more radical ideas, and they, as they travel around the country, they take those ideas with them. Censorship is ended during the Civil War, so it's easier for people to write stuff and publish uh, new and more radical ideas. And of course, also warfare itself kind of breaks down some of the divisions in society. And so it's easier for people to come out and say stuff that, that they wouldn't have normally been able to say uh, before. Um, also, of course, the Toleration Act uh, is brought in and that means people don't have to go to the Anglican Church. So um, control uh, is released. And therefore, during the public era, you get kind of three probably streams of nonconformity or dissent uh, being uh, more easily available. First is Presbyterianism. Now, that's largely seen through kind of the uh, the main sort of Church of England um stream that a lot of Presbyterians join the Church of England and are able to work inside it. Of course, Presbyterians believe uh, that they shouldn't have bishops. Cromwell's uh, Triers and Ejectors Committee allowed for the bringing in of uh, clergy who were not um, sort of traditional Church of England clergy. So Presbyterians, they're quite big. Um, secondly, independent or Congregationalist churches kind of mean the same thing. These are the people who want uh, local independent churches, ones that aren't plugged into a national structure. And they're set up uh, and uh, they achieve quite a, a good level of organisation. Baptist churches similarly as well, they have more connections with each other, um, but they believe in adult baptism rather than child baptism. And finally, our old friends, the Quakers, um, really kind of come to come to the fore during uh, the Republic era as well. Um, they are less welcomed and they're seen as being more radical. And there are other groups around them as well. And of course, the James Naylor case is a great example of this, where Naylor is allowed to kind of go around and preach about and stuff. Uh, but when he goes into Bristol uh, on a donkey, either pretending to be or claiming to be uh, Jesus Christ, and that's kind of a step too far. And uh, so he's taken to Parliament and um, uh, put on trial. He's branded with B for blasphemer on his forehead. He is whipped in the streets and he is, oh, are they bore through his tongue? Uh -huh. um, now, all those things are kind of public things to deter other people from doing it. And then he's put in prison for life. Now, what this shows, of course, is that there was religious toleration, but it had its limits. And actually, that's also seen during the Restoration. There were Presbyterians who worked for the Restoration. Two good examples of that are Edward Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S, from York, um, and John Shaw from Hull, Shaw, S-H-A-W. Um, both of these are in your textbook. Uh, these are two Presbyterians who help General Monk in his procession, procession south and also go over to meet Charles II before he comes back at Breda. In fact, John Shaw became royal chaplain. So these are two Presbyterian ministers who are uh, pro-restoration uh, pro and partly because they're kind of worried about further radical ideas. So not every dissenter is a radical. Some of them were quite moderate and modest in their um, uh, expectations. However, of course, the restoration very quickly turns into a bit of a nightmare for them. The Clarendon Code uh, is established uh, in the early 1660s, 1660 to 64, with the Act of Uniformity and the Five Mile Act and the Conventicle Act um, and all that jazz. Um, and what this leads to is um, a uh, strong um, and widespread persecution of dissent and nonconformity. And one of the things to remember about this is that not all the people that they're persecuting are even people who want to leave the church. So some of them, of course, like Quakers, have opted out already, but some of those nonconformists wanted to stay in the Church of England and just, just have it become more pure, more Puritan, less Catholic, as it were. Some good examples, again, these are from your textbook, but John Shaw, that uh, Presbyterian who had travelled to meet Charles II and had become royal chaplain, he loses his job as royal chaplain um, uh, and he goes back to a uh, Rotherham, in fact, to help out the vicar there, and he is ejected from Rotherham in 1662. Um, a chap called Joseph Wilson uh, was uh, made a vicar in Beverly, and he is also um, kicked out. And under the Five Mile Act, when he kept preaching, uh, he was forced to move further away. Ralph Ward was encouraging people in York to um, not attend the Church of England. It's quite unusual in that. Uh, and that they didn't need to conform and, and he is prosecuted under the Act of Uniformity. They actually don't get him under that. And then he's prosecuted again under the Conventicle Act for hosting, organising religious meetings that were not endorsed by the Church of England. 
he is imprisoned for 21 years. So the Clarendon Code leads to sustained persecution of the dissenters. Um, but uh, by sort of 1669, it's clear that it hasn't really worked in terms of rooting out the dissent. And that's because it really tries to catch too many people. Dissent and nonconformity has grown a lot in popularity and there are lots of committed and dedicated individuals and quite well established organisations. And, and it just can't get to the bottom of all that. Um, I should mention also, of course, Quakers are heavily persecuted in this time, um, not least because they refuse to take oaths um, and also because they're kind of uncontrollable in their religious ideas, that they very much believe that God speaks to the individual and therefore that they're kind of quite dangerous um, into to 17th century minds. Things do get a bit better in the 1670s, early 1670s, uh, when Clarendon's dismissed in 1667. He wasn't really behind the Clarendon Code, it just sort of marks a bit of a shift in, in political emphasis. The cabal is a bit more religiously diverse, a um, bit less uh, conservative in that sense. Um, in 1672, Charles II brings in the Declaration of Indulgence, which allows a bit of a breather anyway from persecution. But under the pressure of needing cash for his war against the Dutch, he has to withdraw that. Parliament's still keen uh, on the persecution. Through the 1670s and into the 1680s, the dissenters uh, tend to, or did, form an alliance with the Whig uh, group of politicians. Um, and uh, that's because the opposite uh, faction in Parliament, of course, are the Tories, who are very kind of pro-Church of England. Um, and they really believe in uh, kind of uh, keeping things the same, whereas the Whigs are in favour of reform. Now, that seems like a sensible alliance between the Whigs uh, and the nonconformists. And of course, there's overlap in some of the people there. But in particular, after well, after the exclusion crisis, they fall out with uh, Charles II through the exclusion crisis. And then the Rye House plot in 1683, when uh, some Whigs were plotting to get rid of Charles II, when that's uncovered, that allows for Charles II to unleash an, a new massive persecution of Whigs in particular. And that catches up um, a lot of uh, dissent and nonconformity with it too, because they're, they're sort of blurred together. And um, the result of that is that in 1683 to 86 is probably the worst time to be a dissenter. And to the extent that groups in Devon stopped meeting at all, there were no dissent or nonconformist non groups meeting there. In Yorkshire, there were still some dissenters uh, meeting, but only at night uh, to avoid being found. Um, and so that's a real kind of period of, of, uh, of, of darkness, I guess, at the end of this period of this uh, whole era. However, when that persecution stops in 1686, it's noticeable how quickly dissent and nonconformity recovers, how quickly it springs back. And this, like I said, is to do with the, the strength of feeling and commitment of individuals, but also the organisation and structure that they've put in place um, uh, as groups. And so what I would say is that at the end of this period, you've, you really do have um, a time of uh, uh, of growth of nonconformist uh, and dissent. Now, at the start, it's kind of small in terms of numbers, but influential. During the Republic era, it, it grows, but there are fears about it. It's also limited in its growth because the Presbyterians really are kind of working in the established church. They don't need to be uh, so dissenter, dissentery, nonconformist. It's in the period of the Restoration where the dissent nonconformist really needs to nail their colours to the mast. And they do that effectively. And even though they're persecuted, it's probably the worst time to be a dissenter. Actually, that's the time when we see that they are so well established uh, and there to stay. And of course, after that, into the 1700s, the 18th century, uh, toleration grows and uh, the amount of dissent and nonconformity increases through that time, too. I hope that's helpful. Um, do go back and look at your textbook on this because it is it's pretty good at giving you examples of people and in, and uh, and groups um, that and how they they how they survived and thrived. Thanks very much. Uh, see you next time. We'll be on to theme three um, about society and intellectual change. See you then.